Hi, my name's Peter Badu, and I'm from Imperial College London, and today I'm talking about my work with Ananda Oza, Nick Moore, and Darren Crowdy. So as you can probably tell by the background video, we're particularly interested in schooling, whether that's by fish, as illustrated here, or of birds, or really of any other natural flyer or swimmer. And schooling is a phenomenon that has always fascinated scientists, and there are still lots of open and perhaps controversial questions, such as how and why these natural flyers and swimmers occupy certain configurations or formations. And we're particularly interested in how hydrodynamic interactions between these flies or swimmers can mediate the formations or configurations they choose to occupy. We're particularly motivated by a few recent studies from the Courant Institute. In this green uh, box here, you can see the experimental setup for one paper. So these two wings are heaving in the same phase with the same amplitude at the same frequency, but they are free to determine their separation distance and their translational velocity. And it turns out that these wings almost always choose certain quantized states as stable equilibria. So by stable equilibria, I just mean that they're moving at the same velocity. And on the graph here, you can see on the y-axis we have the schooling number, and the schooling number is just the distance between the wings divided by their wavelength. So an integer schooling number means that a whole wavelength, the waveform of the wake, has been uh, traced out by the by the time the follower hits it, whereas for half integer multiples of the schooling number, that means just half a waveform of the wake has been executed. And you can see on this graph, the markers, which correspond to the experimental equilibria observed, are almost always on these integer multiples of the schooling number. And it's a similar story when the wings are not in phase, but there's a phase lag between them. So again, now the schooling number's on the, y on the x-axis, and we see that these markers uh, almost always lie on these linear but periodic curves. And uh, a lot of other people have looked at similar studies, and I particularly want to point out the session later in APS uh, U01, and it seems like there's really a huge number of fascinating talks going on there. And there are uh, quite a few mathematical models to describe this work, but they're all, all limited in one way or another. And in particular, there aren't many studies that consider the effect of multiple interacting wings analytically. And therefore, the goal of this talk is to present and drive an exact solution for these hydrodynamic interactions, uh, not just for, for two wings, but for three, four, for actually any number of wings in any configuration, and also uh, executing any motions, not just heaving, as we saw here. So I'll now outline the various assumptions that we make in our model. So our model is very inspired by that of Wu in his seminal paper, Swimming of a Waving Plate. We consider an arbitrary number of swimmers, so here there's just three, and we make the thin aerofoil assumption, namely that these are executing small amplitude motions. Moreover, these motions are harmonic, and the wings are embedded in a background flow, so in this they're moving, you could imagine that they're moving to the left with velocity u. And assuming that the flow is incompressible and irritational, as might be the case for, for swimmers or certain types of birds, we can construct this, this pressure p that is harmonic. And now the game is to find a p that satisfies the given no-flux boundary condition that are prescribed by the motion of these wings. We also assume that the wakes are semi-infinite and continue downstream indefinitely. So in order to tackle this problem, we use conformal mappings. Because of the small amplitude assumption, we can model the wings as flat plates. So in the physical domain, the, the wing can just be modeled as this blue slit. And we want to construct a mapping from a nice circular domain to this blue slit domain. Well, in this simply connected case, this is very straightforward. It's just the Tchaikovsky map that is well known amongst fluid dynamicists. And you can see that this map has a simple pole at zero. That's indicated by this, this pink dot here, because we're mapping from the interior of the disk to the exterior of the slit. One point has to be mapped to infinity. 
Well, as part of this work, we've derived or identified a multiply connected analog of the Tchaikovsky map, which is given here. So now we're not just mapping um, the blue disk to the blue slit, we're actually mapping the these other excised circles to these other slits. And this mapping, it was actually known by our colleague Darren Crowdy, but it hasn't yet been identified as a multiply connected analogue of Tchaikovsky. And it's valid for any connectivity, so I've just illustrated a triply connected example here, but if we took out more circles then we'd get higher connectivities as well. And the beta in this map corresponds to the pre-image of infinity, so it's this pink dot here. And omega is a special function known as the Schottky-Klein prime function. So every circular domain has an associated prime function. So if we change this circular domain, we change the image domain here, and we also change the prime function, and that allows us to express this multiply connected Tchaikovsky map in a consistent manner, regardless of connectivity. So to give you some further insight into this map, I'm going to plot the doubly connected Tchaikovsky map. So here we're mapping the annulus to the exterior of two slits. And in this case, there's a very simple form for the map. It's just given by these Lorentz series in this red box. And this form is very computationally attractive because this infinite series decays very rapidly because Q corresponds to the radius of the interior circle in the annulus. So this series is, is, is uh, decreasing very rapidly. So now we're equipped with these mappings from the circular domains to the slit domain, we can construct the solution to the fluids problem inside the circular domain. I'll just briefly outline how we do that. So any aerodynamicist would know that in these potential flow frameworks, the solution has a square root singularity at the leading edge of the wing, and physically speaking, that corresponds to the leading edge suction force. So that means that our solution in the circular domain will also have a singularity, although it's a simple pole. And essentially there's a clever way to extract that singularity in a manner that allows us to then construct an analytic solution to the whole problem. So I'm not actually uh, telling you the solution here because it requires some things like integral transforms and it's not um, it's not like super simple to write down. There are some special cases that are very straightforward to write down, as I've illustrated in this red box. So this is the pressure field in the circular domain for a pair of wings that are heaving in phase at the same amplitude. And you can see the solution is written explicitly in terms of this K function. All that is unknown are these, um, these coefficients a0 and a1, and those are the leading edge suctions that need to be determined by quadrature. So in the simply connected case, when you just have one wing doing whatever motion, uh, those integrals can be expressed in terms of special functions, in particular the Bessel function. So that's why you see things like the Bessel function appearing in like the Theodorson function, the Sears function, and those other classical aerodynamics functions. In the higher connected case, we don't believe there are special functions for those, those integrals, so at the moment we're doing numerical quadrature, which is uh, very rapid, and really it's not much, far, not, not much slower than the simply connected case. And then in these plots I've illustrated the solution for different, um, for, yeah, for the regular part, the singular part, and then the full part. In the singular solution you can kind of see the square root singularity going on at the leading edge. So equipped with these solutions, we can do some parameter sweeps of uh, various parameters, such as the configurations of the wings. So suppose we fix one wing in this position here, and then we take another wing, and then we compute the thrust, or the difference in thrust, between those two wings in that particular configuration. And then we move the wing to another configuration and compute that thrust, and then carry on, and continue. So basically we're sweeping over all possible positions for this, this other wing while keeping this wing fixed and we're computing the difference in thrust between the two wings there. And if we do that then we get a colour plot like this. So as I just explained, one of the wings is fixed, although you know it's executing these small amplitude motions, 
and we're computing the thrust difference for for the width for when the other wing is in a, a different position. So here, the white colour indicates that the thrust is equal uh, on both the wings, whereas blue indicates that this wing has larger thrust, whereas red indicates the converse. These these two aren't so important. What we're really interested in is the case when the wings have equal thrust. And the reason for that is that these wings are executing identical motions. They're both heaving in phase. And therefore, a necessary condition for equilibrium is that the wings should have equal thrust. Because they, they'll roughly have the same drag, and therefore, for them to have uh, zero net force, they must also have the same thrust. And that's indicated by these white curves. <coughs> and uh, yeah, wherever it is white. And you see there's some really interesting structure going on here. You can kind of immediately identify there's, there's two main regions. There's this center region that we might call the dipole dominated region, because that's the, the position where the forces on the wings are dominated by the one over z effect. Whereas there's another region outside of that dipole region that we could call the wake dominated region. So that's the case where the, the fluid forces are mainly defined by the effect of one wing swimming in the wake of the other. And we we're really excited to get this plot because it recovers uh, the experimental results that I mentioned at the start of the presentation. So uh, I just said that we have uh, necessary conditions for equi equilibria, namely where this plot is white. And you can see in this inline case, which was considered in that PRF paper, um, at the start, we we recover these equilibrium configurations that are separated by integer multiples of the schooling number. And really excitingly, uh, these plots suggest that those equilibrium configurations can be continued away from the real line, away from the inline configuration to some staggered configurations. And I believe that some people will be looking at similar uh, cases to that in the uh, the the uh, the U zero one of other session here at APS, <clears throat> and we can also look at how the phase difference affects these curves. So now on this uh, this top row we have the difference in thrust, whereas on the bottom row we have the sum in thrust. And now the blue means that the sum in thrust of these wings is less than the sum if they were operating in isolation, whereas red means that you're basically getting more thrust out of your system compared to if they were in equilibrium. And we're plotting a few configurations in phase, uh, half out of phase, and completely out of phase. And you can see that there's still this main dipole structure and the weight structure, and they're kind of being shifted or merged by changing the phase. Um, and then th we can also look at the ground effect configuration when these wings are in antiphase. Th these will be in equilibrium, and also you see a large increase in thrust there. Finally, I want to talk about undulatory motions. So th this is when the wings are, operate are executing uh, motions such as this, because we're not constrained to just look at heaving motions in our model, they can be doing any motion, and you get some quite interesting plots where there's almost always an increase in efficiency or an increase in the sum of thrusts when they're undulating. And again, we see that the ground effect configuration is somewhat optimal. So to sum up, we presented an exact solution for the hydrodynamic interactions between arbitrary configurations of wings executing arbitrary, um, arbitrary motions. And I've particularly presented computational results in the case where, where we're doubly connected and there are just two wings in the system. Part of this involved uh, extending the Tchaikovsky map to multiply connected domains, and what's really exciting about these solutions is that they unify experimental results and suggest positions of new equilibria that we hope can be observed in experiments. And uh, there will hopefully be a paper available in early 2021, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll be happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you.